So today we're going to talk about reinforcement learning and in the context of games. And like I, I mentioned earlier, this is my favorite lecture to give because it kind of, for two reasons. One is that it's sort of like approaching the frontiers of AI research. Uh, and we'll, we'll see with reinforcement learning, it's sort of the most, really the biggest unknown area that, uh, that exists in AI and really represents maybe kind of like the pinnacle of um, AI tasks. It represents things interacting with the real world rather than very sort of static containers that we've mostly been looking at so far. And um, it's also kind of fun because a lot of the applications that have been demonstrated are using games. And so there's just a lot that we can kind of play with. Um, I'd like to start with this quote from The Glass Bead Game by Hermann Hesse in 1943. Um, Hesse wrote this in German and the book is called Das Glassspernspiel. How's that? Das yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I read it when I was young. It's uh, open. Did you read it in German or in English? In German. In German? It's yeah. Beautiful. It's one of my favorite books. Yeah, I highly recommend this book. It's, um, it's, the, so the book is, I'll, I'll give you a synopsis of the book and then I'll, I'll read this, this passage from it. And it may not make any sense about <laughs> with respect to reinforcement learning just yet, but I'll make the connection in just a few mo moments. So the book it, it take, it is, ab uh, is about, um, it takes place like centuries into the future in some fictional uh, country in Europe called, Cast uh, or, or in a province of Europe called Cast Castalia. And um, I think Hesse said it takes place in like the 28th century or something like that. And it's years and years into the future in which Basically, like society has become this kind of like intellectual utopia, and uh, in particular, there's this one province, Castalia, in which all of Europe's like most sort of like esteemed intellectuals gather to devote their lives to the pursuit of this one game called the glass bead game. And the glass bead game is uh, is the the precise rules of the book are uh, the precise rules of the game are never actually totally identified. It's kind of just like alluded to in various parts of the uh, of the book. And it, it has to do with like, there's these, there you have a board and these glass beads that you move around. And then the players make these like disparate connections between various intellectual fields. They'll like make a, a an analogy between literature and music or like physics and uh, I don't know, sociology or something like that. And, um, and so it's just really sort of, yeah, it's kind of heady. And the game, the, the book is a biography of, at the time, the world's top player, uh, the, the Magister Ludi, as they say in, in Latin. And, um, and it's basically about how he is struggling with this uh, sort of this existential crisis as to whether devote himself to these uh, intellectual pursuits that are totally disconnected from the realities of the of the everyday world, or to teach, and to be and to you know to sort of submit himself to the real world and be sort of more useful to society. All of Hesse's books are basically about this, actually, <laughs> which is for anyone who's ever read them. Um, and uh, since we're since we're going to be talking about games, I'd like to I'd like to start with this. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read the passage. A game, for example, might start from a given astronomical configuration or from the actual theme of a Bach fugue or from a sentence out of Leibniz or the Upanishads. And from this theme, depending on the intentions and talents of the player, it could either further explore and elaborate the initial motif or else enrich its expressiveness by allusions to kindred concepts. It represented an elite symbolic form of seeking for perfection, a sublime alchemy, an approach to that mind which beyond all images and multiplicities is one within itself, in other words, to God. So, yeah, really, really heady passage. And I'm going to give you another quote also. This is from Lee Sedol, who was uh, the, world's, he's the world's most decorated uh, Go player of all time. And Go is this, uh, we're going to talk about Go later. Um, it's a game that... Uh, I think has many parallels to the glass bead game, not the least of which are the beads that it's played with, as you can see. And Lisa Dahl is, is uh, sort of the most decorated champion in Go history and was recently involved in a match with, uh, with a computer 
that was built by the group DeepMind to play Go. And uh, DeepMind actually won. It was a five game series and uh, DeepMind won four to one. And this was the, the moment at which Go fell to the machines. So 20 years ago, uh, the, the year I guess that, that Alex was born, we had a chess champion, uh, Gary Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue. How many of you remember that? Yeah, a few of you. 20 years ago? It was roughly 20 years ago now, yeah, 97. 97, yeah. So in 97, for the first time ever, uh, uh, the world's top ranked chess player won to a, uh, lost to a machine. But at this time, and I was, I was totally captivated by this because I was a young like, chess player. I really was into chess when I was a kid. And, um, and I, you know, this, this was like the moment that like, wow, machines can play. We can create machines that can do these like human intellectual endeavors really effectively. And it turned out actually reading years later that at that time, it was actually a bit of an illusion. We hadn't really defeated, we hadn't really yet uh, gotten to the point where chess players were, were, were eclipsed by machines. It just turned out that Kasparov played wrong. Kasparov prepared against Deep Blue as though it were another human. But then it turned out that other like chess players who were actually much lesser ranked than Kasparov figured out like, okay, well, machines have certain kinds of weaknesses and they started exploiting them. And there's actually, there's a, a lot of really um, interesting games you can look up uh, between some of the worlds, like even, even um, after Deep Blue, like better chess computers that were beaten by, by human players who exploited these sort of, um, you know, like weak reasoning in, in uh, machines. But there is also something, this idea that uh, might have been a glitch uh, in the uh, deep blue system that uh, totally uh, disturbed the uh, Kasparov. That's possible also, yeah. And you can see it's like a one year old, uh, I mean, just one year ago, they released a kind of uh, old story about that uh -huh. uh, from the development team of yeah. uh, deep blue. Is that right? Okay. I'll have uh, to I mean, that. it seems to yeah, be yeah, yeah. Uh, an input. Well, anyway, I just want to mention this quote from Lisa Dahl leading up to the series. He, he wrote, or he said, I will do my best to play a beautiful and interesting game. I really like this. It's like he didn't say, like, I will do my best to beat AlphaGo or I will do my best to, like, you know, win the game. It was like, I will play this beautiful and interesting game. And what's really interesting about Go, when you hear, like, the, the top-ranked players talk about it, they talk about it in terms like this. They talk about how the game has... There's all this sort of like, sort of beauty to it, and they use a lot of. They talk about how they can feel the board. You know, people will make comments like, like Go players will be like, "Well, I felt that this was the right move." You know, they kind of look at the board and they have this sort of intuition for it. And uh, and I think part of the reason for this is because Go is actually, in spite of the fact that the pieces are all have the same privileges and they don't even move, you just put them on and they they stay there. The uh, game is actually much more complex than chess because the board is bigger. And so the number of possible Go games is uh, something, some in astronomical number. We'll actually see that later. And so there's a lot of intuition that's built into the game. You know, players play for many years and then they're uh, capable of, of doing these spot analyses, looking at the board and being like, I feel that this is the right move. You know, they play with this sort of intuition. And whereas chess, you know, I learned chess uh, when I was a kid, and chess is this very, very, like, severely an analytical game. You know, like, chess players train themselves to be able to visualize many, many different game paths, and they analyze them very, they scrutinize them with the utmost careful, carefulness. And they don't usually talk about chess in these terms like, oh, I felt that the bishop had to go here, or something like this. You won't ever hear that. And uh, this is interesting, and I'll come back later when we talk about Go, uh, because um, because we're we're kind of like you know if what is intuition, you know what is this feeling for the board, and is the computer coming up with it? You know, it's one thing for the computer to be able to beat chess because by brute force it's able to figure out all of these different moves, but there's a few strategies built into AlphaGo, which were very very unique and that that don't exist in other game playing systems that we'll we'll get to. But before we get to Go. Um, let's talk about what reinforcement learning is. Um, and reinforcement learning is actually only a part of the whole Go system, but a lot of, uh, a lot of what we'll talk about is, is RL. 
So reinforcement learning is the third branch, uh, let's say it's traditionally speaking, the third branch of machine learning, and we haven't really talked about it. You, we usually say there's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And uh, supervised and unsupervised are very related in some way, right? We're building a, um, you know, like a function which is able to make operations on data that give it some sort of like uh, interpretability, right? And uh, reinforcement learning, the problem setup is completely different. In reinforcement learning, we are concerned with kind of like two things. There's an agent and there's an environment. And the agent is able to take actions which affect its environment and uh, it changes the environment state. The agent observes the environment and acts upon it and the agent has some objective. And it's receiving some sort of a feedback, like a reward. Right? So in many ways, uh, when, when we interpret this, it's really like the, the real world scenario, right? All of the things we've been talking about, you know, unsupervised learning, covnets, and, you know, recurrent neural networks, they're all kind of, uh, in, in some sense, they, they don't have some sort of an external effect on their environment, right? Uh, in agent now, now the whole problem setup is very different and we have a, a ton of constraints potentially. So the environment is potentially unknown um, or it's not observable all at the same time. The uh, reward and the actions, they're all very like, they're, con they're a bit confused, right? And, um, and for example, like, like let's, let's, let's connect this to an everyday scenario. Like let's say we are... Uh, we have an objective to find the end of a maze, right? Well, what is the reward? The reward is getting to the end of the maze and it's very delayed from our actions. So there's this problem in reinforcement learning of delayed, we can't necessarily assign, this is called the, the so-called credit assignment problem. When we're receiving feedback for our actions, we can't necessarily figure out what feedback is associated with what action that the reinforcement learning agent took. Um, so, so we'll see how this is dealt with by uh, machine learning researchers to, to design algorithms which are effective at navigating, you know, sort of the real world, the complexities of the real world. Um, and also, just to make another analogy, I, I like this one from, from Jan LeCun, and I, I think I've mentioned Jan LeCun. He's uh, one of the first people to really kind of bring covenants from the, from the, from the dark. Uh, he designed the, uh, the first really successfully widely deployed convolutional neural network and he's a big name in, in, um, in the deep learning movement and now he's at Facebook actually so he's used to be at NYU now he's the head of like machine learning research at Facebook and he wrote after the AlphaGo victory a nice little quote which I like so if intelligence was a cake unsupervised learning would be the cake supervised learning would be the icing on the cake and reinforcement learning would be the cherry on the cake we know how to make the icing and the cherry, but we don't know how to make the cake. So what he's saying, he's, he's really big into unsupervised learning, which is, you know, like taking data and making sense out of it. Uh, and, and he's saying, you know, the cake is really the hard part right now. We kind of understand the notion of reinforcement learning, like how an agent should act upon its observations. We don't, we just don't know how to make the observations. That's kind of what, what he's saying. And uh, which is maybe, you know, one could argue some of the bounds of this. I think a lot of reinforcement learning researchers might, might say that we don't really know the cherry on the cake just yet. Um, but, but the cherry on the cake does, is something that represents that, like, this is the thing that we're striving for, right? It's the very top layer, is once we uh, have the ability to, like, make sense of the world, we can design agents which, which act upon it and change the world in some ways. Um, you know, make, uh, take actions which, which have consequences and maybe they're good consequences or bad consequences. And um, so reinforcement learning is really sort of one of the least developed fields and most widely like misunderstood kind of branch of machine learning. It has many, many applications and uh, robotics is the first and most obvious one. So robots, right, are, are agents that are navigating the real world they take actions which affect the real world and they receive feedback, like if the robot's doing a good job or if it's not killing anyone, that's good feedback. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and it's really hard to make good robots. And we saw with the, the Boston Dynamics video 
that we're doing pretty well now making robots that can kind of navigate rough terrain. Um, but, but robots also have lots of, they're, they're really far behind humans in terms of like gripping things and, you know, tactile motion and really just thinking and reasoning. Um, the reinforcement learning is also widely used in things like operations management, industrial, um, industrial applications. So again, we're, we're creating agents which, which have some sort of a interaction with the real world. So finance and operations management is, is, a, is a big part of it. Um, and games. So we're going to talk about games. Uh, because in games, what do we have? We have usually like a protagonist inside of a game state. And the protagonist is navigating the game or trying to, to win or get points or something. And um, it has to learn how to take actions. And the, the key problem, let's see if this is, yeah, so let, let me, I'll get to this in just a second. The key, pr there's a few problems with, with designing robots or, um, or agents in general, is that we have to make a few, we have to, by design, we actually build in a lot of limitations or not limitations, but a lot of like handicaps. So we know that if we build a, an agent or a robot or something that moves in the real world, we understand that it can't necessarily know everything about the real world to begin with, and it has to learn that as it goes. So we have to build systems which are able to learn very quickly from its environment and how to act upon it. Because, you know, if we're building robots, we can't, it, it, let's say you want to build a, a, a self-guided helicopter. Well, you can't let it crash a thousand times f uh, before it becomes good at something, right? We have, to, we have to be able to make it understand very quickly how to fly because it's too expensive to keep rebuilding them or maybe they'll bring harm to people that they crash into or things like that. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of, lot of limitations. And so this central problem of reinforcement learning is how do you make the agent learn quickly by, you know, by learning from its mistakes, by learning from its observations, um, and acting upon them. And that's sort of like the central problem. So uh, recently, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been tremendous progress in this field of reinforcement learning. And it's been mostly like many areas, including, um, including unsupervised and supervised learning, it's been mostly coming from the deep learning camp. So there's this now new emerging field called deep reinforcement learning, which is basically the application of deep neural networks to reinforcement learning. Uh, and the way uh, that, and when the context in which this was first sort of um, uh, recently kind of brought to attention was by this group called DeepMind. And we're gonna talk a lot about DeepMind. I already mentioned that they built the computer that played AlphaGo. And they're kind of the leaders in, in reinforcement learning. They're owned by Google, so Google acquired them like a couple of years ago. A uh, really, really hot company. And um, they had a paper in Nature, uh, I think a year ago, in which they described, uh, and it's not often that machine learning gets into Nature. So that's, so that's kind of like, it's kind of a big deal when this happened. Um, they built a computer which learned how to play Atari games. So the computer is controlling the joystick. It's not literally a robot. It has access to the, you know, it's like, it can, it has, con it can navigate the, the, the game. And it learned how to play and beat Atari games, like really simple ones. Now that may not seem very impressive, right? Because Atari games are really, you know, they're really simple. It's just a joystick and, you know, it has some sort of a simple objective. But it's going to become a lot more impressive when I tell you um, the constraints under which they put themselves. So the first thing is that they learned how to play those Atari games without any knowledge of, of basically anything about the game other than the pixels on the screen. So it doesn't know what the, so the, the reinforcement learning agent doesn't know what the objective of the game is. It doesn't know what any of the, like let's say you're looking at the screen, we see all these baddies. You can almost, you can see intuitively, all of us can see like, okay, this is our, our protagonist and these are a bunch of baddies and this is our score. The, re the, the computer is not given any of this information. It's not given the location of these baddies. It's not given the location of our protagonist. Anything about the objective, it's given nothing but the pixels of the screen, the field of vision that it receives. And it's given that, and it's given a joystick. <laughs> and, and it's given a score. So that's the one, those are the three things it's given. Uh, perception uh, of the screen, not even perception, but visibility of the screen a reward, which is coming over time, 
and the ability to take actions with a joystick. And it learns how to play and beat these Atari games, and pretty quickly also. Uh, and it does so by, observe, by taking actions and then observing you know, like what the reward for those actions coupled with the game states that they were played with uh, what those rewards are like, and then it makes inferences from that, and then it learns how to control the joystick better. Now, the problem setup seems like really, really harsh, right? It, it's like it's almost unfair. Like, well, it should be easy for us to tell it, you know, all of these different things that would be very high, you know, useful information. Uh, but it turns out that the reason why we handicap it in this way is because we're we're concerned with making agents which can generalize to different game states, right? They can generalize to different tasks. We can't afford to, it's impossible to make a, uh, a smart agent which uh, is programmed with all these expert instructions about like this game works like this, this game works like this. We want to make computers which are able to learn just from what they perceive uh, how to act upon their environment. And so this one algorithm that they developed was able to not only play this one game, but it was able to play many games. So they would give it different games, which which many of which were drastically different from each other, had very different objectives. You know, some are about, uh, you know, shooting bad guys. Others are about getting to the end of a level. Um, others have even more complex objectives. And uh, despite this apparent diversity in all these games, a single algorithm was able to learn how to play and beat all of them. Uh, or not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and that's, that's really impressive. Yeah? And was it programmed? Yes, it more or, more or less. It's okay, receiving. So that's what it, knew. it didn't figure that out. Yeah, it's although it's the reward. It's the same reward as the one you give to the neurons to, uh, to make them uh, train. We don't usually refer to that as a reward. No, um, okay. It's like, but but there is some overlap, and we'll see that neural networks are actually used for for this task. Um, but the but yeah, but here's the thing: different games, the rewards can be very, very different from each other. So again, like with shooting the bad guys, you have a score, and so the reward is constantly going up. But in some, in some games, the reward basically goes from zero to everything when you get to the end of it. So the reward is extremely delayed. And that's really important because for a computer to understand which actions it took that led to that reward, it has to be able to associate the action with the reward. And if the reward is very delayed, then that becomes very difficult to do, uh, and so this is the so-called credit assignment problem, which is kind of one of the big one of the big uh, challenges of this field. Uh, like the only thing you can do is shoot. So you mm -hmm. do the only thing you can do, and then you see what happens. You get Well, sure, that maybe for some games the task seems is more observable. But in other games, you'll, well, I'm going to show you a few examples of the games that I learned how to play, and you'll see that some of them are much more difficult. And did they have like, a physical thing that moved the thing? No, no, no. Um, no. There's no like like robotic hand on the joystick. They just they just yeah, have access to the control. controls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not what they try to do yet. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but technically, it would be impossible to create something like the glass town view where there is no reward, where the reward is in the process. This is well, who knows? We, we haven't gotten we're so far. We're at Atari. Uh, oh, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Maybe in the 2800s, yeah. Um, okay, so this is, I'm going to show you a few of the games, and I'm going to go through all of these. These are all, these are different games, uh, including, I forget uh, what some of them are called. This is like Sequest? I think Sequest. This is Pong. This is, I forgot, well, this, this one's Breakout. I know this one's Breakout over here. Uh, we're just going to look at them actually individually. Um, okay, so this is Pong. So at first, 
the green agent, that's our computer. So at first it's like, it doesn't know what the hell's going on. So it's just standing there and letting the, the this is a weak AI. It's playing against some weak AI, you know, like a really simple one. After an hour, look, it starts to kind of wiggle around and like, and it doesn't really know what it's doing, but it figures out like, oh, sometimes I'll hit the ball and it'll bounce back and occasionally I'll even score. And when it, and then when it scores, it gets a reward, right? Now, after, after this many hours of training, it becomes pretty good, right? And you see that it's, it's competitive now, it's 5-4. It's still kind of confused, right? But, it, but it, it's able to return the ball and get points once in a while. Okay, after 10 hours of training, it's basically unbeatable. It's just like, it's dominating. It's, it's just absolutely dominating the other, the other agent. <laughs> and the other agent is a computer. Effect. Yeah, but a really basic one. Like, well, and one that knows that like they, you know, it gets to know the rules of the game, right? Because it's programmed into it. Um, so it's like expertly programmed. And this is a, you know, yeah, four, 15, it's just total domination. What if you let two learning Ah, we'll, we'll see it when we get to go. When we get to go, there's something like this that's actually happening, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the next one is um, Breakout. This one's really cool, and they like to use this as the example. So Breakout is the game where you have to hit the blocks. So you have just like a, a paddle at the bottom of the screen, right? No domain knowledge involved. Doesn't know what the ball is or anything. Um, it's just you, you guys have... Fast forward this. Uh, yeah, so after, after some training, okay, so this is, the, you guys know this game, right? You have to hit the blocks, right? So again, at first, it's not super, super good, right? But if we move on, move on a little bit, we'll see that it'd be, uh, I keep pausing. We'll see that it gets really good after some training. It learns how to, how to get the ball back and beat these, right? And then the really neat thing about this is that um, after a while, after a while, uh, after some amount of training, yeah, this is where the magic happens. So if you guys ever played this game, you know that the optimal strategy is to build a tunnel in the, um, in the board, right? And it figures this out. It gets the tunnel all the way in the left side. I think it figures this out. Yeah, it builds a tunnel in the left and then it gets it on the other side and it just gets lots and lots of points. So this is not programmed in, right? It just figures this out because it's sort of the optimal strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, okay, Sequest. So it has to shoot things. At first it kind of waddles around the water. And this one's difficult also because not only do you have to shoot the, the blocks, but there's this, it has, it has to um, get oxygen. So the ship has to, every once in a while, go up to the top to get some oxygen. And again, so now, now you have like complicated objectives and constraints placed upon them. You see that by the end, it becomes really, really good at, at uh, you know, shooting these guys and then occasionally getting oxygen when it runs out. See, it's running out of oxygen and gets some, fills up, and then keeps going. Yeah. And then this is uh, Space Invaders. Yeah. And again, like all of these have different objectives, right? Some of them are shooting games. Some of them are... Um, you know, get to the other side games, and, and others have, you know, different kinds of constraints, like in Sequest, you need oxygen. Um, this, in Space Invaders, is a little simpler, uh, but autonomously, one algorithm is able to learn how to play all of these. So, um, let's talk a little bit about how this is, how this is, like, implemented. Um, usually, we, uh, the way it's described is using what's called a Markov decision process. So we interpret the different game states, which are, you know, nothing but a collection of pixels, right? It's just a collection of pixels is our game state. We interpret them as different states, and states can transition into, other, into each other, right? And um, you can take different actions that will lead from one game state to another. And the task of the reinforcement learning agent is to kind of figure out, like, given a state, what action should I take to feasibly bring about another state? that I desire. Um, and it's modeled in this way. And actually, like, if you unfold this, and you can visualize it as a matrix, and this is kind of like we're getting to where this can be formalized through math. And this, all of this has to be discovered uh, through experimentation, mostly. And uh, we're not going to talk about the, the details of this. It's very interesting. And I encourage you to, there's a couple of uh, 
really nice classes online that are, are very um, sort of insightful. But um, but I want to I want to keep going to <laughs> to what what we're um, dealing with. Okay, so challenges, right? It's a very dynamic system. Uh, the actions are uh, the actions and their consequences are unknown ahead of time, uh, and because we are taking actions upon the upon the environment, and the environment has uh, and the environment affects us. There's this sort of feedback loop, right? And it's a, it's what you might call a dynamical system. Everything is very like time sequence dependent, and uh, very hard to predict. You know, it's hard to predict one thousand, you know, time steps into the future what things will look like. You have to kind of learn through trial and error and in short bursts of time to to sort of uh, to and to to kind of try to. And this is maybe what we do, right? We 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 don't try to look too far into the future. We just try to analyze with the best information that we have, what we can do right now to kind of like get ourselves into the best position possible. Um, time matters. So there's this like, um, you know, we've been talking about like with covenants, for example, they're, they're sort of like, they're just, they're static, right? We talked about how they're different from recurrent neural networks. And here time is, because of this whole notion, is a very, very critical, um, is kind of this critical element to these game systems. And um, of course, I already mentioned this, the credit assignment problem. How do you associate actions that you took with the rewards that you received? Um, that's, not, that's not very easy to do. And the information is very low quality. So again, in the Atari playing system that DeepMind built, the uh, only information that's given to it is the pixels of the screen. There's no, nothing like this is the paddle, these are the blocks, this is the ball. And this is the objective, none of that, just pixels. Because it knows that it can rely on that at least. So if it, all, the, all the Atari games, you know, you can get access to that at, at least, but then you can't really do much, much more. Um, you can't give it more expert knowledge because otherwise it doesn't generalize. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the problem set up. And um, what's called deep Q learning is the method that, that has been recently developed to to do this at, uh, to do this very well, and what it does is it, it's the application of deep neural networks. Typically, in this in this what we'll talk about is deep convolutional neural networks uh, applied to this reinforcement learning setup. And um, I, will, I will, we won't talk about Q learning like what what it means specifically. We'll talk mostly about neural networks, but Q learning is this like um, is this kind of way of formalizing the reinforcement learning problem as a sort of like kind of what we were talking about with like a Markov decision process. You have states, you have actions, and you have rewards. And um, with Q-learning, we're kind of concerned with like taking actions that bring us from one state to another and figuring out how to properly navigate those systems. So uh, yeah, covenants to the rescue. So what do covenants have to do with all this? So let's say you have the screen pixels, right? Um, the, and you want to figure out how to move the joystick. So we can actually uh, construct this problem, and this is how the DeepMind group did this to play Atari, as a convolutional neural network problem. So the idea is your input is your screen, right? So you get all these screen pixels, and um, you set it up as a, as a neural network going from the pixels of the screen to your, your final, uh, your layer is game, is um, actions to take, right? So this is like, imagine this is our last layer of neurons in the convolutional neural network, and it's a bunch of actions that we can take. And with Atari games, it's really simple. You can either, you know, move the joystick in these directions, or hit the button, or both at the same time. And, uh, and so these are, you know, we're concerned with, it's basically a classification problem, right? We're trying to classify Given the the pixels on the screen as our input, what action to take? Uh, and it's yeah. Wouldn't it have just wouldn't it have known like just hit all the keys and see what happens? You know, like as a first initial like setup. Like, that just, like, so then it would know that which key created the thing. And then... That's basically what it's doing at first, right? So at first. When it and all it has is pixels, and you know it has this random, randomly initialized convolutional neural network, its actions are going to appear to be 
fully, just totally random because it has no knowledge at all of what it's supposed to do or what actions will bring about which consequences. And so more or less at first, it seems to be doing random things. But then this is, this is the whole notion with training, right? We're training the neural network by giving it rewards as it, uh, as it kind of moves about. And then it tunes the weights of the network gradually so as to figure out the relationship between the screen pixels and, this, and the, the optimal uh, action to take upon them. Does that make sense? Uh, but that's the work also without knowing anything about the thought. Because, like, you could just figure it out as, as, as you would have asked me how it really works. Like, Sorry? Like, you could work also without knowing The controller is how it moves, how it takes actions. Yeah, like it's not literally like a, a like a robotic <laughs> head. Yeah. 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 Uh, long time after, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like with the oxygen uh, issue. Yeah, right. It's harder to, uh, to get how it's kind of connected. Yeah, the credit assignment problem, like how it deals with this, how to, uh, it, so, so remember with covenants, right, we're always like trying to use um, like back propagation to train the weights so that it brings about our, like uh, it gets our, it makes our accuracy go up. Here it's, it's more or less the same thing, except, um, except those observations are, have to be made with like trying to, it kind of has to hedge its bets. So it doesn't necessarily know exactly which action led about to which reward, but it knows maybe within a range, it can kind of maybe have a probability distribution, I guess, over what actions led to what rewards. And maybe as it observes that certain kinds of actions with certain kinds of delays lead to certain kinds of rewards, it can sort of, it never quite figures it out. It's kind of like a, it's always hedging its bets a little bit, but it is able to, over the long, over a long period, average it out uh, and, and, and properly train. Um, so this is, but, but you can see how like the problem is well suited for covenants, right? Because, you know, we have screen pixels. The pixels are very low level information. But really, the game is all about objects in the screen, right? Paddles and blocks and so on. And covenants help to uh, discover these features, right? We're, we're concerned with discovering features and then being able to detect them. So detect paddles and baddies and things like that. And so covenants are very helpful for that. Yeah. How does it get the uh, reward? It's given. It's given. So that's... Yes, yes, there is, that, is the, those, that is the one thing that's given to it, an actual like score, so feedback. Can't, can't read the score. It's, not, it's not reading the score, yeah. Um, well, that is part of the screen though. So it, it, if it, it, it probably learns to ignore the score. I, it, it doesn't need it because it's given the... <laughs> um, it doesn't operate with any memory like in the RNN. It's different. Um, there's no, no, there's no, there's, it's not a recurrent neural network. Um, in principle, maybe you could a apply RNNs in this problem setup, but it, they didn't do anything like that. 
Um, there is some things like some minor details that I have mentioned that like, so for example, it doesn't actually receive just the screen pixels, but it's allowed to receive like the last few sets of them. Yeah, the thing that it actually gives it is a sort of like, uh, there is some pre-processing that's done. So it's not just the screen pixels, but it's also like the velocity. Uh, there's a sort of like a, like a frame difference thing going on, um, which it's able to figure out. Um, that helps it to, uh, to, to maybe figure out where things are moving. Uh, but still, it's pretty, pretty handicapped, just pixels mainly. Um, uh, okay, so this is, this is a neat thing they did in the paper where they, they visualized the activations, the, the second to last layer activations of the, um, of the CovNet that was used to play, I think, uh, Space Invaders. Uh, for all of the different game states that that the um, uh, that the system considered, and actually the uh, one of these I forget blue is, yeah blue is the the deep the deep Q network that they built the 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 covenant, and then orange is actually a human playing, and the similarity in distribution is kind of telling because it it, it basically it suggests that the um, that the system that they built is able to kind of generalize to different kinds of um, gameplays that might be pursued by humans, something like this. Uh, I could be slightly off in the interpretation of this. Um, not well, but these are okay. So the TCD is of the of the activations of the covenant in uh, in playing Space Invaders. And the blue ones, they're colored blue for uh, like when the computer learned how to play the, play the game. And orange is a human playing, uh, a human playing the game and then the covenant perceiving it. And it's more or less mimicking the human. Or at least gets a similar, oh, okay. So this, oh, next slide is maybe, is, let, me, let me lead up to that. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's basically just, just to mention that's more or less the, Atari games, this got into nature. They were able to, to, to beat uh, lots and lots of different games. And this group is, uh, is very active and is now pursuing even more difficult games. Um, they're trying to play uh, Quake and Doom and games like this that are way harder because they have tons and tons of pixels. And also um, now the reward is like extremely delayed. Like if you ever play like those shooter, shoot em up games or whatever you call them, um, they are um, you know, they're much more complicated than, than Atari games, not only because there's more pixels, but because a lot of the environment is now not visible, right? So it's like, it's kind of 3D and maybe you can't see behind you. Uh, and there's all sorts of like constraints that make the problem very, very ill-posed. Um, but they're making progress. We haven't beaten Doom yet. Um, and actually the thing that they really want to play is um, uh, StarCraft. Is that right? Did I say that right? StarCraft? Minecraft? No, no, no. Uh, StarCraft. StarCraft, right? Anyone play StarCraft? It's this strategy game. Like, uh, it's apparently it's extremely complicated. No way. Is this not? Is this right? Yeah, StarCraft. Yeah, it's this. So they're playing extremely complicated like strategy games, uh, and they want to train an AI to beat to beat it. Um, and so they haven't made much progress yet, I don't think, but maybe that's something for the future to aim for. And again, the problem setup is the same, so it's a very handicapped system. Okay, so let's move on to something a little lighter. Um, so there's this subculture in, um, in games of creating levels. So, you know, you, you can create levels in emulators. You can make your own Super Mario levels, for example. We're going to look at one in just a second. Or your own, like, um, you know, whatever your favorite video game is, you can make you can make levels. And there's a subculture, I guess, in the Super Mario level making scene, is uh, to make these impossibly difficult levels, like the most insanely hard level in Super Mario that you can imagine. Did everyone play Super Mario at some point? Like everyone knows what Super Mario is, right? Um, so, uh, the, so I'm going to show you one of the levels. You can find a lot of these in YouTube. And I'll explain the connection to this, to, to deep neural networks in just a moment. But this is, uh, 
Yeah, so so this is a, a level that was created by someone for Super Mario. And yeah, it's pretty hard. The amount of tears this pain will bring is undescribable agony that there will be no life left in your soul. Something like this. Yeah. Alright, so check this out. <laughs> I think what they do is they like use an emulator and then you can, you can pause it and keep rewinding. You know it's a computer so they can... Uh, but but the, the, the connection here is that like, um, you know, with, with something like this, right, you can potentially imagine that a uh, computer would be very well suited to beat a level like this. You know, with, there's no sort of sense of reaction time. See this? It's just an expert. <laughs> yeah, I think this is scripted. Well, no, yeah, right. I mean, it's like the... I think, you know, there's some developer who um, is able to pause the game and... So, are you guys too young for Super Mario World? My ICP class is on only this thing. Like, <laughs> you guys are... Most of you... Like, so only a few people actually play this game this game from the late 90s. Uh, maybe it's because we're in Europe. Uh, I would like to the random and the Yeah, yeah. Maybe since I know. I think, yeah, there's some of this going on, yeah. Scrolling for Yeah, yeah. Maybe with a bit more of context knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, you can just imagine there's like uh, applications of, of trying to beat these things with computers because there's no sense of reaction time or anything. Okay, so this was made at the uh, University of uh, is it Freiburg. Freiburg? How do you say that right? Freiburg. Freiburg. Um, so reinforcement learning in real life. So this is a very classical problem for a reinforcement learning agent. It's learning how to balance a pole. So again, and all it's given is the ability to go left and right, and the reward it's receiving is nothing but you know whether the pole is balanced. So it's just learning is kind of swinging around and like trying to figure out like okay nothing's really happening, and then maybe after a little while of like learning, it learns how to kind of move left and right so as to balance the pole. Uh, so well, after. Yeah, balance it upright, exactly. So, crowd 25, it's like kind of wiggling around. It still doesn't know what it's doing, but then after a little while, let me test for it. How does it know when it's got it up? It's being given feedback about, like, it, it has a, um, it's measuring the angle. I think I think it's measuring the angle of the, of the thing that's holding it. Okay, yeah, so now it's starting to swing it. Still not very good. There we go. Starting to swing it higher and higher, and then at some point it almost holds it up. And then after, okay, I think after, I think at this point it's just about yeah, able to balance the point. So it's okay, it's balancing it, but it's but it gets even better after a little while. It begins to compete with a human adversary. Right? Okay, so now it's 227 trials. Now it's able to hold it up more reliably. And actually, at a certain point, the guy will come in and start to mess with it. Where are we now? 236 trials. Now it does it really fast, too. It's actually trying to, trying to disrupt it. Pretty good, right? Okay, let's lead up to go. Let's just see how we're doing it, then. What was the name of the project? Uh, I forgot. It's um, just look up like hard balancing pole with Freiburg. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about AlphaGo. And we're going to lead up to it by first talking about two other games, Tic-Tac-Toe and uh, Chess. And we'll see how we were able to, to beat uh, the world's top ranked Go player. So um, we can think of Tic-Tac-Toe as also like in this sort of game state action uh, method, right? And you can visualize all of the possible games of Tic-Tac-Toe in the following way, right? It's just like you start with an empty board, and then these are, these are you know, colored squares instead of X's and O's, but it's, it's tic-tac-toe. Everyone knows how to play tic-tac-toe, right? Um, so you have nine possible moves in the initially, and then there are eight more possible moves that, that you can go to with the next player, and then it just branches out from there. And the number of possible... Oh, Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, instead of X's and O's, just colored. <coughs> Uh, you can, uh, so the, the interesting thing here is that like really uh, the number of possible tic-tac-toe boards is extremely small. It's like, it's like less than a thousand. And so it's really easy for a computer to analyze every possible game and say, uh, and, and figure out what the optimal move would be. And it's a, it would be a simple procedure, right? You analyze the game, you count all of the, you, you look at it as a tree and you go through each of branch of the tree and you count up how many of them end up in victory for you and uh, and victory for your opponent and then you just pick the branch of the tree in which the amount of victories you're receiving is is highest right and that's 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 the way you play tic-tac-toe it's really easy um, you can do that because there's only a thousand games right but in chess this becomes really difficult to do because there are too many possible game states in chess so chess, uh, with chess, the number of game states is such that we can't possibly, you know, computers are super fast and everything, but they're not fast enough to analyze every possible sequence of moves and count up how many of them end in victory. And so we have to be a little smarter if we want to uh, uh, design a system which is capable of, of beating the world's top ranked chess player. So the way that, that we deal with chess um, and I'm going to explain in just a second. That this this first came to like public attention 20 years ago, roughly, when IBM built uh, Deep Blue, which was a computer that was play that was optimized to play chess. And um, and they at in the 96 they lost to Kaspar, but then in 97 they won. And so this was like this was the moment at which like basically we we thought that maybe chess fell to the machines, I guess. Um, and. Uh, so with chess, how do we deal with this, this issue, right? So this is just like we're looking at a, 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 chess, um, a chess board. And chess you can also think of as, as a tree, right? It's like a tree of possible moves. And at every branch, it branches out into more possible game states. And every sequence through the tree represents a possible game. And there's too many to analyze all of them. And so what we have to do is uh, we have to figure out a way of of pruning the entire search space. We don't want to look through the entire tree of game states. We want to just pull, we want to just analyze like parts of it that we think are promising, let's say, because we don't have enough time to possibly analyze all of them in the middle of a chess match. And so the way this is accomplished through chess is, um, is in two ways. And I'm just, we're just looking at some, some like images from it, but the, the basic idea is you want to do two kinds of pruning. One is a sort of horizontal pruning. We want to uh, not analyze every possible move that we have, but only a subset of very promising moves. So that's the horizontal pruning. We only want to analyze a subset of moves that we think are promising. And a vertical pruning is we want to be able to tell um, like if a move, like well, how do we know a game is promising, right? Well, the way to do it in tic-tac-toe is to just count up every child node of the branch that we selected and see how many of them end in victory, right? But that takes a lot of time because the thing, you know, branches out into so many different games. And so what we need to do is to be able to sort of analyze a little quicker whether a game state is promising. And the way this was done for chess was combining two things. Uh, so a Monte Carlo tree search, and actually recently... Michael Nielsen told me this is incorrect slide, so I might be wrong about this. <laughs> he said that they didn't use Monte Carlo for, for Deep Blue, that Monte Carlo didn't, uh, wasn't yet 
being used. They used maybe some other tree search algorithm that was related to Monte Carlo, but basically there's a tree search algorithm which is able to uh, pick out game states, or sorry, pick out sequences to analyze, and then and not all of them. So it's able to discard large portions of the game game state. So it's combining this this tree search algorithm, which may or may not have been Monte Carlo. They definitely use Monte Carlo for Go, uh, but not necessarily for for chess. Um, and the, combining that with a an algorithm, which uh, yeah, let me let me get to that slide in a second with an algorithm which is able to analyze the board position and tell you, and give it a score of like how good this board position is. So again, the naive way to, to evaluate the, how good a board position is is to look at all possible moves coming from that board position and counting up how many of them end up in victory for you. But because that takes too long, we want we wanna, <clears throat> we wanna replace it with a function which evaluates the score let's say more holistically, um, so to speak. And the way they did it for Deep Blue was they, they got a bunch of chess grandmasters together and they designed a, an evaluation function which was basically like, it had like 8,000 rules in it. It was some crazy, crazy, really, really complicated, expertly crafted uh, function which had all these analytical, like heuristics, basically, like an, 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 to analyze it. So things like uh, how many pieces of my opponent do I have in check? What is the, the how many of the like um, you know tiles are covered by my uh, pieces? How many? What are what is my piece advantage against the opponents? You know things like that that maybe a human player normally does as well. So you don't you don't necessarily go all the way to the end of the game state either. You kind of try to figure it out through uh, by analyzing you know. Maybe you go a little bit into the future, but you try to, to come up with some sort of a heuristic to, add, to evaluate the goodness of the airboard position. Now, this, was, this is really um, crazy because like, this is hard to do, right? This is, there's all these tiny rules, uh, and it was able to save Deep Blue a lot of time. But the disadvantages, of course, like when we think about what we did with the Atari game system, <coughs> is that the Deep Blue expert system doesn't adapt to other games. So if we gave it a, a different game other than chess, that whole function would have to be re rewritten from scratch. And that's the function that took them probably 90% of their time to implement. Um, and so we, we realized that maybe, you know, Deep Blue is a little bit constrained because it, it, it's, it's really sort of pigeonholed into playing chess. It doesn't necessarily play other games very well. Whereas with the Go system, it's actually not entirely true. That, that system is made a lot more along the lines of the Atari games where it's kind of, it's not really given too much knowledge about, about the objective of the, fun, of the game or any expert knowledge. It's, it's a sort of more generic function that can generalize to other kinds of objectives. And we'll see that when we, when we get to go. Um, the, the thing with them, um, and I guess I've already kind of covered Monte Carlo Tree Search, but you know, the central problem in, re one of the central problems in reinforcement learning is how do you pick, how do you balance exploration versus exploitation? So exploration is the sort of horizontal search. How many different moves should we evaluate versus how many, sm versus having a small subset of moves that we think are promising and evaluate them deeper, right? So there's always this trade-off and, and it has to be kind of balanced properly. And this, this picture is, um, there's the, um, the kind of the, usually in like a machine learning course, you learn about this problem of exploration versus exploitation in the context of a thought experiment called the multi-armed bandit. So suppose uh, you're a, um, you're like an octopus or something, I don't know, has, you have many arms and you're at a bunch of slot machines, you're in Vegas or something. Um, or, or let's, because we're in Europe, let's say we're in Monte Carlo. Um, <laughs> So let's say you have a bunch of slot machines and all you know about them is that some of them have, you know, some percentage chance of winning and some have some percentage chance of losing, but you also don't know how much money they give you in return. So let's say you found one slot machine which gives you 50 cents with some, prob some probability of the time. Do you uh, exploit it and just keep on, you know, pressing that with your arm? Or do you try to uh, like search some of the other machines to see if maybe they give you more money or something like that, right? So this is kind of the the thought, the um, you know maybe the metaphor that's kind of useful for understanding the 
the trade-off that we have to kind of balance. Um, and that's how, and so this, and this is like, this is applic applicable to search trees, right? Because we have to decide how many moves to analyze. And with Deep Blue, there's, they were using, you know, in chess, any chess game system, they're using some sort of a, a tree search algorithm, which is trying to balance these. There's, you can't go to either extreme. You have to balance the, balance the two. Yep. Isn't it as well in the long uh, term way more effective if you play against an opponent because the opponent can't analyze your game? So if you have any kind of short term planning, it can't figure out a pattern what you're doing, or it's hit more difficult for the opponent to figure out a pattern. Mm. It's hard to say. Uh, potentially, it is the case that like they they often say that Deep Blue played in ways that appeared not human, and maybe that's an artifact of that. Um, but um, I don't know if you necessarily want to you know like then a human could say the same thing. Like, wouldn't it be better for a human to play in a very short? You know, why is the machine? Why is that true for just the machine? I think for the human, it's the same. It's uh, it's, it's more effective. Because he can't figure out the real pattern now what the machine is like all the time. But the, it, do, it doesn't play everything to the end. It just makes maybe some creative mistake. You know what I mean? Right, right. Well, I, in Which some sense, it is how it plays, I suppose. Yeah. Although a, a lot of the mistakes are really, really bad, also. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you, yeah. You can, can, like, what decisions you make in the beginning of the game can position the likelihood of winning. Yeah. So if you allow it, you might. Yeah, and the other player can figure out that path. He can figure out patterns of how you're reacting. And you don't want that because right. then you lose. But it's not all about uh, being able to understand what the player is doing. There's other things that are valuable to you. No, but it's in, I guess in chess, it's, it's a valuable information to know how a player plays. Which is more drastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is so the way Deep Blue handled it was using uh, a tree search algorithm, which I think was Monte Carlo tree search, but maybe it was a different one, uh, with this expert analysis function, which would evaluate the game state, and then it would basically pick the branch which gave it the, the, the maximum likelihood of winning, given this, this evaluation function and the, and the tree search. Um, okay, so that brings us finally to Go. Uh, now this happened, first of all, how many people were, were aware of this when it happened? It was in March. Big news, um, lots of news about it. Um, and the, uh, what happened was that, D, uh, that um, DeepMind, which built, which we've been talking about, they, they made the Atari game uh, playing AI. They uh, built a system designed to play Go. And in uh, March, it beat the world's top-ranked Go player, um, or who, who was the top-ranked Go player? Uh, Lee Sedol, who's, a, who's from South Korea, and, and is like kind of the most decorated champion in Go history. I, I forget his, uh, you know, he's a top-ranked player, and he's won the world championship many times. I don't know the exact um, names of the championships, but um, very effective player. And, um, and this was in March, and it was big news because, because AlphaGo won. And brought a lot of attention to to DeepMind. Now, um, the uh, let me just quickly describe the rules of Go. Uh, Go is not really well known. It's not super well known in the West. Uh, it's really much more popular in, in East Asia. So a lot of people play it in, in particular in China, uh, Japan, and Korea. And the game is actually really the rules of the game are extremely simple. You have this 19 by 19 grid. Uh, and you have, you have, uh, you have, there's white stones and black stones. And all you do is you, the players alternate turns placing their stones on top of the, uh, on top of the board. And uh, once the stones are there, they never move. So you don't, you don't move your stones. You just keep on placing new stones and it fills up the board. And the way that you get points is by surrounding your opponent's stones entirely within yours. So you win stones by... 
by basically making by by surrounding uh, your opponent's stones or surrounding um, like empty areas of the board. So for example, this gives black some some points right here. Um, it's a very very. Um, it's so a, you surround them. Do you take the, those points? You, you get the them. yeah. So then they get off the board. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, at the end, you count up <laughs> like all the. Um, so. Here's the thing with Go and what, what makes it so much like so much harder for a computer to do like a sort of a tree search algorithm. So the number of tic-tac-toe boards is roughly 765. The number of t uh, plank time since the Big Bang. So a plank time <laughs> is the amount of time it takes uh, for a beam of light to cross a plank length, which is the smallest unit of like uh, matter that you could possibly have. It's a really, really small amount of space, basically, or a really, really small amount of time. So this is how many Planck times we've had since the Big Bang, um, 10 to the 62, roughly. There are 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. There are 10 to the 20th, 120th chess boards, so it's pretty impressive, right? And then with Go boards, it's like astronomical. And actually, I realized this might be slightly incorrect. I think I might be counting possible Go games rather than Go boards. I have to look, look this up. A bit, I found this somewhere, but it's basically, it's incredible, like the number of, you know, 19 by 19 grid and possible, you know, like possible uh, stones, the way they can be placed and legal, legal game states too. So not all game states can be legal, uh, is, you know, astronomical and totally hopeless for a computer to possibly analyze even, even the tiniest fraction of the possible game states. And so we have to kind of take a more sophisticated approach to planning, planning our Go strategy. Okay. So here's how AlphaGo works, um, roughly how AlphaGo works, the sort of high-level version. So it combines this Monte Carlo tree, it's, so it's, very, it's, a, it's kind of similar, we can start with what we learned from chess, right? It's basically a tree search where we're analyzing a tree of possible game, game sequences and um, we combined with an evaluation function. But it actually uses a convolutional neural networks it uses convolutional neural networks to help with making the analogy. So you can think of the Go board as kind of like an image, right? It's not exactly an image, but it sort of is, right? It's a 2D grid of, you know, pixels or like spatially oriented, uh, you know, data points, right? And so what they did is they developed two convolutional neural networks called the policy network and the value network. The policy network is trying to figure out uh, it, it, so what the, what the policy network does is it tries to uh, figure out what moves might be promising. Like it's trying to horizontally prune the search space by deciding what possible, what moves should we evaluate. And the way it does that is very clever. They took a database of many, many, many games of, of Go and they trained the convolutional neural network to predict the next move using games that were played by humans. So the, 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 the covenant is set up where the input is a game board and the output is what the next move was. So like the sort of the difference, like which, which piece was next. Um, and, uh, and so you can, and they actually, what's amazing is, and this still blows my mind, the policy network by itself is able to predict the next move 57% of the time, just from analyzing Go, Go boards. So this is really interesting because, like we said, you know, there's a lot of intuition in coming up with these games and uh, with these moves, right? A lot of the Go players talk about how they feel this or they, they see that and then they make a move. And we're able to get a computer to predict with 57% accuracy what the next move would be. So the policy network just by itself is actually a pretty effective Go player just by predicting next move, no knowledge at all of like what, what, the, what the objective is, it's, uh, it's able to actually play reasonably well. Like the policy network would beat any of us probably, um, but it loses to good players. Um, it, lo uh, it loses to good players because by itself that's not enough. But that's pretty impressive that it's able to kind of like predict, it's almost predicting human intuition. So when it's doing that, what do we say you know, about that? Is it, is, it, is it modeling human intuition or is it something else? I mean, it's crazy for how many possible moves uh, the opponent could have, you know, at any given moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
mean, it doesn't seem like that accurate. It's, t it's crazy, yeah, it's really scary. Um, okay, and then the value network is responsible for giving us the value of, the, of a particular game state. <clears throat> and so it's kind of equivalent to this, this expert function that we talked about in chess, except the value network, there's no rules built into it. And that's, that's, in, that's crucial because that, that supposes that we, first of all, it's easier to implement so it's not we don't have to get like eight thousand grandmasters together to uh, you know to make an effective evaluation strategy. We do it with like a sort of like a, an algorithm, and the value network is also a cubnet, and it's able to basically predict the value you know give us a score for a particular game state. And here's the way the value network is trained, and this is where oh so, okay so this is just explaining this is a little bit like how you would set up the policy network to be uh, to predict the policy network. So you encode a game state as like um, uh, as a particular game board, and then the output is a one hot vector, which which represents the next the, the next piece that was placed on the board. So it actually it follows very much from from what we've looked at so far. You can imagine setting up a covenant to look to look this way. Um, okay, so here's how the value network is trained. So um, the value, I'm not going to go into all the details of this, uh, but basically like the value network is trained to, to predict the value of, of a particular game state. And uh, the way it figures out the value is, is kind of this brute force way. It figures out like how many times does this game lead to a victory. And so what they do is they actually uh, take, the, they, they create, they, may, they take this policy network and this, value, and this initially, uh, I forget how they initialize the value network, but they, it might just be random when they initialize it, but they take the policy network and the value network and they make a Go player out of the two. And then what it does is it, it, they make two copies of it and they play each other. And they play uh, constantly. So they, like play, they, they train it for days and days where it's just playing millions and millions of Go games between each other. And, the, and this trains the value network because it, it's able to analyze how many of these game states lead to victory. And so over and over and over through playing, you know, basically instantaneous uh, games against each other, the value network is trained to accurately predict the value of a, of a particular game state uh, through self-play. So this is crazy, right? We're, we're taking this Go player, this Alpha Go, and it's playing against itself for days on end. We just leave it in the closet to do its thing. And, it, and it, from this, it's able to train itself until it's able to accurately uh, predict the value of a particular game state. So now you have this, this policy network, which is able to give us a subset of interesting moves, and the value network, which is able to give us the value of them. And so then, using, use, uh, balancing those two, uh, we're able to pick the next move for, our, for AlphaGo to make. And doing this, it was able to beat the world's top-ranked Go player. Now it turns out that Go is hardly the uh, hardest thing we can do. This is actually way harder, apparently. So, so this is Doom. One more question. I think. How oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, the value network doesn't predict the next move. It, yeah, it, um, it's that, okay, okay. it predicts. It pr it basically predicts. The, it gives it a score, which is loosely, re I, which is more or less related to. I don't know the ex what the score exactly is, but it's, re it's related to how much does this game state lead to, this move lead to a, a victory. So does it mean amongst the different options, it kind of rank the options uh, in order of uh, preference? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a 10,000 hours thing, except, I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, like the awesome genre of that we're saying you have to be an expert in the game 10,000 hours in the game. Yeah, totally. But also, this is totally like life, you know? It's like how we learn and how like, you have experiences and like, okay, don't touch the hot thing, okay, don't do blah, blah, blah. And then, so, I mean, it's just so fascinating to me, like, how so much of all of this stuff is just totally a parallel of how the plan operates. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And that's, that's what this game is about, isn't it? <laughs> 
So anyway, um, yeah, it gets really harder. They're working on, you know, Wolfenstein and Doom and StarCraft. And now it gets really harder because, you know, with something like this compared to Atari, there's way more, uh, there's occlusion of the scene. You can't see behind you. The games, there's some of the geometry to the scene. And the reward is very much delayed. And so it's, it, playing Doom is like, uh, with the constraints that are given to the Atari system where it doesn't know the objective or what any of these pixels mean, um, it turns out to be really, really hard. And I suppose in the future, when we're, when we're able to play these games very well, uh, we might be in a state where maybe robotics will also be like in a much better state. Um, yeah, that's it.